Hi everybody, uh, welcome to a new video, uh, webinar, whatever you would like to call it uh, on Developer Nation channel. Uh, my name is Ayan, I'm Developer Advocate at Slash Data and Developer Nation. And today uh, with me is my colleague, uh, Britton, uh, who is an analyst at Slash Data. And uh, we're gonna be discussing about the Pulse Report today. Uh, this is the latest Pulse Report that is available on our website. Uh, from Q1 2023, uh, that means the insights that we're going to be talking about today is from our uh, Developer Nation 24th edition uh, survey. Uh, we're going to be talking a bit uh, more about Pulse Report uh, later, but uh, let's start with the uh, introduction. So, Britton, if you would like to introduce yourself, what you do, and what things you're working on currently. Hi, Ian. Uh, thanks for having me on today. Uh, my name is Brayton. Um, as uh, Ian mentioned, I'm an analyst or market research analyst uh, at Slash Data. And yeah, today I'm here to talk about uh, some of the insights uh, from our most recent Pulse report um, that uh, are uh, derived from our 24th Developer Nation survey, which took place in uh, Q1 of 2023. Awesome. It's great to have you here, especially because you helped compile this report and you have been a great help for putting this uh, uh, webinar together as well. So pretty excited. Uh, before uh, we move ahead and discuss the inside, I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the Pulse report. Uh, so basically, we do uh, more than few reports every year. And uh, most of the report, including the state of the developer nation, are more focused towards, uh, I would say, clients, uh, developer relation professional. Uh, but the Pulse report specifically are more focused and uh, is produced from the perspective of developer. So if you are a developer and you want to make some career choices, Pulse report uh, would be really helpful. And this report has been freely available. Uh, we do it uh, twice every year. Uh, you can find the link to the entire Pulse report. And this one uh, came out really well, I would say. Uh, you can find the link in the description below. And uh, it's, as I mentioned, it's freely available. So uh, make the most out of it. Uh, before starting, if you have any feedback uh, for the Pulse report, uh, just uh, you can comment on this video or reach out to me. I'll, I'll leave uh, the links in the description. Uh, now, that being said, uh, let's just uh, jump right in, uh, starting with the very first insight uh, that we have uh, a plan to discuss today and let me pull that up over here all right so this one britain says that uh, this actually shows uh, top five technologies uh, used by uh, backend developer and uh, this one is really exciting exciting because it has containers it has cloud platforms it has uh, virtual machines so uh, at any given time any backend developer will be using in combination of a lot of technologies we are mentioned here and we have seen a rapid shift toward containers, uh, all thanks to microservice architecture. So uh, in your opinion, like how this trend has evolved over time? And could you share some insights from the last few years? And is there any new technology that you saw entering this particular realm? Yeah. Um, so as you mentioned, containers are um, in incredibly popular uh, for, on, in the backend developer space, as, as uh, yeah, you can clearly see in the graph. And since um, the emergence of Docker on the market, more than 10 years ago, um, we've seen the use of containers has been uh, growing pretty continually in popularity, especially in the last few years when we've been consistently tracking its uh, its use among backend developers. And so our trend suggests that um, in the coming year or so, um, containers will pass the two thirds use threshold, which means that two out of every three uh, backend developers will will be making use of this technology in their in the workflow or and on a, on a regular basis. And um, of course, as, as many of you listening likely know far better than me, the, the benefits of containers are manifold. Um, they enable consistent functionality of software and applications and um, uh, warrant portability across uh, different environments, platforms, and, and operating systems. Um, they also fit continue, or, um, very uh, nicely or seamlessly into CI CD pipelines, which I know we'll touch on a bit later um, in, this, uh, in this talk. Um, but they're not the only technology, right, that um, is popular and being used. Um, outside of containers, we've seen growth um, among several other uh, of these technologies. And no one technology in, in this report um, from this uh, set of data stands out as being significantly higher um, used than others. Um, but what we have been keeping a close eye on uh, recently is um, database as a service platform and also, uh, or, sorry, database as a service and platform as a service, excuse me. Um, and with the increase of these managed, um, increased use of these managed services, um, some of the traditional tasks that backend developers 
previously have had to handle, such as provisioning, configuring, managing databases um, or infrastructure, these responsibilities um, or maybe more low level or, um, responsibilities can be offloaded onto some of these services. And so what we um, have been looking for and what we can, I guess, expect as, as the, the use of these technologies continue um, to grow or rise is that um, it might lead to a shift in, in the focus, the primary focus of, of what it means um, or, the, or what it means to be a backend developer or the, or the primary responsibilities of a backend developer. And so um, we expect that maybe, or, the, or we expect that the use of these technologies will uh, likely lead to more higher level tasks, such as designing and um, implementing system logic or more, more focus on um, things like optimizing performance and um, or improving even even user experiences, um, which have uh, of course been historically in the role of backend developer, but maybe also convoluted with some of these uh, more lower level tasks that now can be offloaded onto these technologies. And so this is kind of what we've been paying attention to um, in the backend development space uh, with the technology use that we've uh, been seeing there. Pretty interesting. And uh, this is also uh, very helpful when you mentioned uh, uh, the rise of uh, DBAS and uh, uh, managed services because these technologies kind of uh, complement each other in a way that DBAS vendors are starting to provide uh, their services in container form. So it's uh, pretty well uh, easily integrated into your overall architecture and uh, pretty easy to manage. Uh, uh, great. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Britain. Yeah. Uh, moving ahead, uh, we have another interesting insight I would like to pull up. And uh, this one talks about uh, uh, top five. Let me zoom that up a bit top five emerging areas of interest uh, to developers. And uh, this one talks about AI, generative AI, robotics. So uh, Britain AI has been a buzzword for a few years now. Uh, but uh, let's say in last year or two, not many people have understood the true essence of AI applications. And uh, this uh, chat GPT thing has sort of revolutionized it and give uh, uh, AI system in almost everyone's hand, whether they are from a software technology background or marketing background, everyone uh, sort of find a way around uh, to use uh, AI systems in their jobs. Uh, so we have been capturing uh, this insight for a few years, and though AI was almost uh, always on the list, it was uh, not further refined down. Uh, but we can see generative AI, AI-assisted software development uh, in the graph now. So let's talk a bit more about these and what insight uh, uh, this graph reveals about the developer's learning behaviors, as per. Yeah, um, as you mentioned, since um, AI is, of course, uh, seen in the news almost da or daily uh, now, and um, since we've included AI um, as uh, an option that developers can select in our survey, it's been uh, just immensely popular. Um, whether or not it's in their interest in it, their involvement with it, uh, or their use in their in their workflow, and so. Um, Obviously, as you mentioned, with the rise of um, ChatGPT and other um, more easily accessible, interfaceable large language models, um, this has popularized AI for many of us. Um, but developers, of course, um, uh, have been working with using it in their workflow um, for quite some time now. Um, the, the top choice, AI-assisted software development, um, it, it's uh, the the appeal is obvious, right? Like I I use it um, when I'm when I'm programming, and I think um, many developers, especially those who are who are less experienced, which is something that we um, have seen in our data, is um, they they make greater use of this AI because it allows tools, additional tools, to be accessible to them that um, maybe are a bit more challenging initially, or or. Uh, um, harder to access without, um, you know, the the assist or the help uh, that uh, AI assisted software development can bring. Yeah, I would say I never like I never formally learned HTML myself, but uh, I don't think now even I have to. I can just ask ChatGPT to create a front end for me in HTML and CSS. So that totally makes sense. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, developers are smart. Um, they're going to make use of the tools that um, you know uh, make their workflow easier, make their workflow more effective. And so this is, of course, why we're seeing such a such a pop or a rise um, in the in the interest and use of um, AI assisted software development. And of course, Gen AI, um, generative AI, also very popular. We have many developers that are interested in it because now so many people can interface with um, these large language models in a way that uh, was less accessible beforehand. Um, 
And also I want to touch on in terms of the learning behaviors you uh, can mention or that you mentioned uh, in your initial question, this um, on our side, on the analyst side, reinforces to us something that we've known for, for a while and that um, de developers are a very reliable uh, canary in the coal mine, so to speak, right? Like they, what, what they're interested in, what they're working on is generally what's going to be in the news cycle in the future for people not working in the technology or not in the tech field specifically. Um, so this is why we think it's so important to pay attention to developers, not just if you're in the tech space, but also if you're a company um, in general, because it tells you what's on the cusp of becoming applicable um, outside of the pure tech world. 100%. And so, uh, yeah. Um, and so, um, for example, um, other areas that um, are of interest uh, outside the AI are um, things like robotics and quantum computing. And in the news, we've seen both of these um, a lot recently. We've seen um, on the robotic side, obviously, we've seen uh, drones used um, in uh, various contexts around the world, around the world, especially in conflict situations. But then also in um, in the industrial and domestic setting too, we've seen an increase in use um, and uh, affordability of um, of robotics uh, as well. And then for quantum computing. Um, if you've been following tech news, um, you, you'll see that many companies, many of the large tech firms are, are in, an, in a race, um, essentially, to, to develop accessible um, quantum computing uh, in, in the future. And this, they say, um, or this will uh, transform actually many of the other, uh, many of the other areas of interest that um, are, are shown on this graph. Um, including robotics, self-driving cars, and of course AI. Then this this area of focus will um, will have impacts throughout those sectors as well. And so, yeah, uh, what I take I guess from this is listen to developers, um, and you'll be able to to understand um, understand the future. Hundred percent. Quantum computing is actually sort of uh, fun uh, to see in this graph because uh, the other day I was discussing Web3 and uh, the Web3 developers have shown keen interest in quantum computers and uh, sort of the developers in the room, we kind of concluded that whenever a technology reached to a certain point where we see that the current computing power is limited, we kind of rely on quantum computer and futuristic aspect that, okay, uh, our current computers are not able to handle this uh, AI model or uh, this uh, decent centralization node so probably quantum computing gonna solve that so you know let's also take a look around all right fun uh let's move to the uh, interesting uh, chapter next and this one has been a topic of debate in our community and communities around the world <laughs> forever since i could remember and this one shows top five programming languages used by developers yeah. So we have seen uh, JavaScript being leading since many, many years now. Uh, uh, let's break down this insight and talk a bit more about where developers are using this programming language and what accounts to their growth and popularity. Yeah. Yeah. So this is uh, one of the most um, maybe deeply personal choices, right, uh, to developers um, because they want to be able to keep their skills up to date and marketable. Um, uh, jobs often um, or very frequently require use of certain use and knowledge of certain program language. So um, and, and also these are these are the the kernels or, or epicenters to some of the strongest communities um, in, in the developer communities. Um, so. Uh, yeah, they're extremely important. They also have um, very important uh, implications for for toolmakers as well, because they want to create the most useful and, and utilize software development kits. So in general, it's um, yeah a very important item to track, and uh, which is why we do, of course, uh, year over year. And um, yeah, as you mentioned, JavaScript continues to take the top spot. Um, it has more than twenty million um, uh, active users worldwide. We estimate. Um, and even in the last six months, uh, or sorry, excuse me, 12 months, it's still growing um, very strongly with, uh, and we estimate that it's added around 2.6 million users um, in the last year. So still very much um, likely to be unchallenged into the future. Um, of course, a number of uh, factors affect this, but um, a classic driving factor in the use of JavaScript is of course its use in the web development space. Um, Java and Python, um, we've seen in the in the past couple of years, have generally been neck and neck. Um, Java slightly ekes out over Python, um, but both have just over 17 million users worldwide. Um, 
yeah, uh, so both are uh, a close second or second and third to JavaScript. Um, Java is one of the most uh, important general purpose use languages, of course. And um, in the last two years, it's seen incredible growth, actually, with um, with more than eight million adding more than eight million users to its um, to its core database. Um, this growth we is both supported by the more traditional sectors such as um, cloud development or, or mobile, um, but also we've seen a growth in the in the AR VR field, um, and this is uh, in part due to the fact that um, uh, Android's popularity um, has grown also as an AR um, VR platform, and so we've seen a lot of users uh, be attracted from this. Um, Python, on the other hand, um, is one of the, the more simple languages to use, um, but uh, it has applications throughout um, from beginners to um, experts. And you have one of the uh, strongest online communities um, in language or of the programming languages for Python. Um, and so while especially in these top five, we see a lot of consistency um, in terms of where they rank with one another, um, where it really gets interesting and where we see start to see some disproportionate um, numbers is when you look at the individual technologies, for example, what we were just talking about in the, in the previous section. And um, I've just been uh, working a little bit with our uh, DN25 data, um, which is from Q3 of 2023, and looking a little bit at the, uh, the language use patterns. And for example, we just finished talking about quantum computing. Um, in quantum computing, you see disproportionate uses of languages like Swift, um, Go, and Rust. And so it, it's really in these specialized or um, technology use areas or um, spe specific interest areas where we see the more, uh, more dynamic dynamicism um, in language use. And um, uh, yeah, these are the areas where we've been paying attention to to, to kind of track where languages are being used um, or being used as well. And um, that uh, particular insight will be available for free in the coming month or so um, in our state of the nation uh, de developer um, uh, report, yeah. which we publish for free um, yeah. in the beginning after every uh, after every survey. Hundred percent. That is really exciting, and I look. I'm looking forward to reading that one. Uh, I'm more of a Python person uh, per se, but I could see uh, well. the limitation when it comes to uh, finding libraries because uh, let's let's get honest, there is like a huge chunk of library for every sort of developers, whether you're in Web3, whether you want to do uh, security, browser authentication. And I personally also believe that uh, uh, because the learning curve and uh, the opportunities are more in web development, uh, new developers kind of uh, uh, cling more towards JavaScript realm uh, compared to other. But yeah, I would love to see uh, Rust uh, approaching there pretty soon. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's kind of interesting to see. All right, uh, moving to what's the next one. And uh, let me pull that up first. So this one talks about uh, what motivates you to contribute to corporate or vendor owned open source project. We asked this question to the survey participant. And this has been my favorite insight from the Pulse report, uh, mainly because too. back yeah, back in the days, I also uh, look for uh, specifically corporate owned uh, open source project. I kind of have this thing that uh, if I contribute to them, I'm going to be mentored by some of the best people in the industry and might end up working for them in one way or another. But uh, yeah, uh, so this, as I mentioned, is my favorite uh, one from the report, uh, discussing it further. So uh, often there are some software companies that have a few open source projects out there. Uh, Airbnb has some of the best graphic library open source. Uh, uh, there are a lot of different organizations. Facebook has open sourced a lot of different uh, projects and entire frameworks. So. Let's talk about uh, why developers choose to contribute to these projects uh, from a report perspective, uh, because you have been uh, closely involved into the survey and report compilation. So I want to uh, I want to seek your opinion on this one. Yeah, um, for me, this is also one of the the coolest um, insights from this report. And um, what's uh, awesome to me is that um, we see twenty five percent of developers do not contribute to open source project, but this means that 75% of the developers are, which is an impressive amount. Um, so they, uh, when you when you say open source project, uh, did you specifically mean vendor on open source project or yes. open source in general? Yes, yeah, sorry. Um, thank you for the clarification. Yes, uh, vendor open source projects. Um, Amazing. Just, um, yeah. Um, 
relating specifically to what we're seeing on the graph. Um, but the fact that 75% of, of developers are contributing to these vendor open source projects is an impressive amount. And as you mentioned, developers do it for a number of different reasons. Um, the most popular reasons are the one uh, that you mentioned, right? Uh, you're, you learn, you gain some skills so you can learn to code better. Um, you also get feedback from you know, uh, impressive mentors, very knowledgeable people in the field. And um, I've seen actually in some cases um, that uh, companies, especially startups, uh, will this is this is part of their application process is that you um, you have to make contributions to their open source software. So. Um, we see not only that, um, of course, developers um, in part want to do it to contribute to something bigger than themselves. We see just over one in five developers wanting to do that, but also developers are smart and, and doing it for, for reasons that will benefit them. Um, and so uh, this is, this, in my opinion, speaks to a number of different things. It speaks to the motivation of developers and, and why um, they're looking for these projects to contribute. Um, but then it also speaks to the strength, I think, of the developer community, which we've seen, um, of course, in a number of different um, in a number of different manners, uh, where we see developers helping one another out in in cop or in popular um, uh, in popular uh, chat rooms or, or platforms like Stack Exchange in the past. Um, but then they also want to contribute to something that will benefit them, and um, that they will improve upon software that we're using, which I think is the second most unpopular or second most popular reason. Yep. That is great. Uh, it's fascinating to learn that even startups have started to ask, uh, yeah. like if they wanted to work for that company, here's our open source project, give it a try. Here are some good known first issues that you could work on and see uh, how we are accepting uh, pull requests, uh, what sort of discussions are happening. Uh, it's really fascinating, and uh, I would highly encourage uh, everyone to uh, look for the projects that you believe in. Uh, and even if you want to learn to code better or any product that you want to improve, uh, if they're open source, uh, do contribute. And you can contribute not only not only by uh, writing code, but also by improving documentation, talking about it, and all sort of things. Uh, topic for another discussion. Uh, but uh, moving to uh, the last part of uh, this uh, Pulse Report discussion, and this one talks about uh, the popularity of uh, CI/CD tools, and uh, this has been an area of great interest uh, for enterprise developers specifically, uh, because uh, uh, continuous integration, continuous uh, deployment uh, uh, is something that uh, you cannot really escape in today's time, and uh, you need uh, some good tools uh, with some good community support, uh, with good plugin support to have your CI/CD pipeline uh, up and running, and also uh, always uh, ready to serve you with the latest and the greatest uh, code. So no software company can live without uh, employing a good CI/CD infrastructure. And uh, uh, just in general, Britain, what does this insight tell you about the CI tool software is time? Yeah, um, I, as you rightly acknowledge, um, CI/CD pipelines are are essential um, for modern software development companies. Um, and they and they mitigate a lot of the risks that um, are often present when you do larger, less frequent releases. Um, so the question we ask developers um, to, to measure what tools they're using is um, multi-select, which means that, that they are able to select any and all of the tools uh, that they use in their CD, CI CD pipelines. Um, and the most popular one we see here is um, is Jenkins. And more than um, or more than half of developers um, who are involved in in making these CI CD pipelines um, use this, which really speaks to to its popularity. Um, the second um, most popular tool that's used here is GitLab. And 46% um, of developers uh, report using this in their uh, CI CD pipelines as well. And there's pretty substantial overlap actually between these two top tools um, with uh, half of all Jenkins users actually using GitLab and 43% um, of GitLab uh, users using Jenkins as well. And I'm sure many listeners on here will recognize or will know this better, far better than I do. But um, of course, both have um, distinct purposes, but they're also very complementary as well. And this um, pretty substantial overlap between the tools uh, highlights that pretty nicely. Um, so Jenkins, of course, is, is more specifically built for um, CICD pipelines, which speaks to its immense popularity as we see here. Um, and it focuses on automating various tasks 
um, in this process, such as um, uh, building, testing, and deploying um, applications. Whereas um, GitLab is is a bit more of a um, of, of a comprehensive DevOps tool um, that offers a range of capabilities uh, that go beyond um, CI/CD pipelines, but that um, can very easily be used for self-hosting CI/CD pipelines as well as we um, as we see in our data. Um, but it's uh, yeah broad er, yeah and its broad range of functionalities fits very well with tools like Jenkins to create a very robust um, continuous integration continuous development um, process. And so um, we also see that Azure Pipelines is another common tool, and City Team and Circle CI um, finish off the finish off the top five list. But overall, what developers use, of course, depends um, on factors out of their control, like institutional history or memory, um, and organizational needs. Uh, but uh, what is consistent is um, we see these CI/CD practices, um, yeah, being utilized by by any modern software development company, because as you mentioned, they're um yeah essential in a word can't escape, can't escape it yeah pretty interesting uh i feel that uh, uh gitlab because it's also a version control software and uh, building uh baking uh, ci right into that tool that kind of uh, take lots of hassle in setting it up uh, maybe that could be the reason for its second popularity uh github also experimented with it and they are still going strong with the github actions and uh uh, they used to have a strong integration with uh, open source uh, Travis CI. Now they have that, like their own. So it would be fun to see uh, if they could make it to the list in coming uh, seasons. Uh, Circle CI, I believe uh, Linux kernel uh, used it. I'm not sure if they're still using it, but that's sort of like a massive open source project mm -hmm. uh, built on uh, CI or Circle CI. So uh, really interesting uh, uh, graph and would love to see how this involves. So we're going to be keep coming back to it in future yeah uh, but yeah that brings us to the end of our discussion uh thank you very much britain for joining me today uh as always you can check the entire report the pulse report q1 2023 it's available on our website links will be on the description uh we value your feedback so do leave it out there uh on the video and you can also reach out to me personally on our uh, on our forums a uh, link in the description as well uh any last word britain before we sign off no, uh, thanks so much for having me on. I had a great time and um, yeah, uh, look forward to talking more in the future. Awesome. Thank you for joining me today and we're going to see you again soon.